Reds, and welcome to The League, exploring the League of Legends lore from A to Z. My name is Rebecca. And I'm John. And I'm Mark. And today we are talking about the Frost Archer Ash. She was released February 21st, 2009, so one of the very early releases, and she has a shit ton of lore. Yeah, there's a lot that goes with this lady. It's like an avalanche, almost, coming down on us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <Ooh. laughs> uh, so on the universe page, she has a bio and a video called Enter the Freljord, which is interesting because, like, I feel like she's in a lot of videos, and I don't know why they picked this one. Yeah, it's weird. That's, like, 90 seconds long. Uh, she also has uh, four issues of a comic series called War Mother and a short story called The Harder Path. I feel like we're getting into a routine of I'm going through the Riot Universe page and just in order consuming what they have and then the two of you just go buck wild. And I kind of like this routine <laughs> because I like yeah. see yeah. <laughs> I like to see how much I know compared to how much you two know, you know, based on what Riot has given me that's right there based on if you guys want to dig a little deeper, I guess. Sure. Yeah, I, I like that. I like not having to look at the alternate universes, which I know John does. So mm-hmm. it's perfect. It's great. <laughs> Everybody wins. <laughs> I guess we'll start with her bio, though, to to really just start at the beginning, I suppose. And I think Mark is going to take us through that journey. Yeah, <laughs> that journey, that quest. Yeah, yeah, we'll go through it. Um, there's definitely some overlap here with War Mother, but I think it would make the most sense to tackle that separately because that's a pretty and, you know, it's a four-issue comic. It's dense enough that I think it, it can stand separate, and we can talk about that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so getting into Ash's bio. So she was born in the northern Freljord to the the small Avarosan tribe. Her mother's name is Grena, um, who's also the war, mo- the war mother of the tribe, which um, I think we mentioned that that word once or twice. It's going to come up a ton. Uh, <laughs> but they're essentially chiefs, right? It's They're, they're essentially chieftains. But Ash is an iceborn. Uh, we kind of get, I, I will mention War Mother once here because we do get that, we talk about Iceborne a bit with Anivia, we get a lot more info on Iceborne through Ash, and it seems that, it, it seems like it's it's an ancestral thing, a hereditary trait that some people are Iceborne and some people aren't, and it seems like there's a lot more than I expected. I thought it was like Ash and Sejuani and that was mostly it, but we find that there's like whole groups of them, in, like there are whole tribes made of them, yeah. right? Does that sound right? Yeah, a lot but, of a lot of the elite warriors are just iceborns. <laughs> yes, essentially, yeah. If you're an iceborn, you tend to it seems you tend to be an elite warrior because you can brave the cold better. You're better and all that jazz. So anyway, Ash is an iceborn, and because she's the daughter of the War Mother, she's kind of got this expectation that she's going to be the next War Mother, and she feels very burdened and isolated because of it. Um, except when she spends her summer hunts with Sejuani. Uh, so. Those two tribes were friends for a bit, and while growing up, Ash would go spend summers with Sejuani. Apparently, Garena, not Garena, I guess, by the way, this is something that kept <laughs> having in my head, because it's literally just missing the A, so in all my notes, I just read it as Garena, uh, but no, it's Grena, did something to offend Sejuani's grandmother, and they stopped talking. They're like, <laughs> the whole context to frame all of this in is like cousins where parts of the family aren't talking to each other. And, <laughs> Uh, someone posted something on Facebook, and now oh it's, you don't spend summers anymore. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as she got older, Green started searching for the throne of Avarosa, which is this legendary kind of uh, like loot hoard. It's the big loot box that she's trying to find, <laughs> full of all sorts of stuff, and she thinks this is going to send the Avarosa back to glory. Kind of re- that's their destiny. She got an S. <laughs> she got an S in a match and has a loot crate now. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to get the key, man. The honorable. <laughs> but um, Grina is not leading the tribe very well. And at War Mother kind of covers part of this, but she's not leading the tribe well. She's kind of obsessed with it. And eventually it leads to her death and the tribe being scattered to the winds. And Ash kind of left alone fleeing. Uh, Ash follows her mother's last map and manages to get to the grave of Aphorosa and finds her true ice bow, avenges her mother's death, and heads out west. And it says, it's a little unclear here. We we Again, we find out more of this in War Mother, but... Uh, she kind of ends up protecting some people, and instead of taking them in as as thralls, as slaves, she just adopts them into her tribe, which is a pretty revolutionary thing, I guess, in the Freljord. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, it's just expected that you're going to take these captives from your raiding or whatever. Um, anyway, so she ends up leading a pretty big coalition of tribes. Uh, her follower, followers start believing that she is Avarosa Incarnate, which you know she doesn't believe at all, but she plays into it to help cement alliances with tribes in the south. 
it comes up that she has to get married and that she, you got to find a husband apparently. <laughs> and she kind of recognizes that if she marries any one from one of these tribes she's allied with or multiple, because that's a whole thing we'll talk about, um, is this going to cause even more problems? So she picks out Trindamir, who's this vagabond from this barbarian tribe who showed up in the capital one day and has been, he's essentially a pit fighter. He's just dueling constantly, it says. Uh, yeah. But she picks him out and says, hey, if you'll be my one husband and protect and help kind of like ward off all the suitors and whatnot, you, you know, we'll be my political husband. Um, so he does. Fun little fact here. It is believed that Brom is actually the one who introduced the two of them. He saw Trindamir pit fighting, and Trindamir was uh, giving in to his rage and was probably going to kill the person he was fighting against, and then Brom intervened until the rage wore off, and then he and Trindamir had a drink, and he introduced him to Ash. That's uh, really sweet. Like, hey, Ash, I just stopped this guy from straight up murdering this dude. I think he'd be good for you. I mean, you know, Wingman Brom, he knows he knows people. Matchmaker. <laughs> And really, that's 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 the end of the bio. Um, they it, they fall in love for realsies, even though it's a political union to start. And um, now Ash is kind of at the head of this big coalition of tribes. So that's Ash from the bio. Mm-hmm. What do y'all think? Yeah, um, I really liked the bio. It was interesting that it's written the same way as a lot of others, where it's very matter of fact, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. But I still found myself like kind of being on Ash's side in a way and it could be my connection to the game so it's hard to say like if I was biased in that way because I like Ash in the game too so but I I did enjoy her story and I found it um definitely much more interesting and then when we when I read War Mother which we'll talk about I I definitely felt uh really connected in the way that I hadn't sense a collie I think and connecting with characters yeah i i would i definitely agree i, I really enjoyed the bio i, I liked this more than a collie i think um mm. there's a bit of a weird the, the, the bit at trendamir at the end is a little weird and out of left field and it feels like such a, hold, a holdover <laughs> from you know they're they've been married since the beginning you can't yeah. not have it right and it's like okay it's fine but beyond that yeah I, I agree the rest of it i thought was really strong especially for a bio and, and often the bio is where we find the weakest parts and but i think this was really good it gave me a lot of uh scenes that I wanted to see kind of played out and two of the three we actually yeah. got from the, the supplementary content the supplementary content so I was really happy with that too um, yeah yeah it was good I feel like a lot of the bios even though they're very like matter of fact like it doesn't seem like there aren't a lot of story points that the bios go through mm-hmm. um, like there's not a whole lot of story there there's not a lot of meat on those bones <laughs> Whereas the the Ash one, there was there was a lot. There was you know her her time under her mother being the matriarch. There was the whole journey to become the matriarch herself. There's the whole post you know becoming Avaros and reincarnate basically. Like there's like her whole life is interesting. It's not just like one particular point like a lot of the characters we've talked about so far. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. I actually really like the idea of her as being a very shrewd political uh, leader and strategist almost, the way she always seems to approach things, even just in here as being very real politic. Like we, fuck this Avarosa stuff, how can I get this situation figured out? And that she she's willing to play into it when it, it's necessary or when it is the most advantageous thing to do. Um, and I would really love to see, the one thing that we don't have that I would love to see is how she forged those alliances with those southern tribes. Because um, that seemed to be what really solidified the power base that she kind of stands on currently. But yeah, I, th- I think this is really strong. The line they had there about that was kind of interesting to me because she said that she had forged a lot of those alliances by letting them know that if they were able to unify then they would able they would be better able to defeat kind of neighboring nations which makes me wonder how many of those tribes are really looking to get out there and fucking expand <laughs> it's a really good question and we can talk about it after we've gone through everything else cuz that's like high level <laughs> is what ash is creating sustainable is it like a cult of, a cult of personality like are we talking about caesar's legion they'll just like fall apart you know or whatever um, <laughs> yeah, one of her quotes is like, "My tribe will bring peace to the north. The so- the south should fear us." And she's all about Freljord, but for people from Freljord. So it's who the fuck knows what happens if if she gets all all that power solidified. Yeah, she has um very Daenerys Tar- Targaryen vibes for me. Um, just kind of her whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
in the way she gains respect and I don't know. I'm hoping her story has a better ending than Danny's. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so should we jump into, I mean, we could talk a little bit about the video that was on. It, it's mostly, it seemed like an introduction to Lysandra. I know the video you're talking about. Um, <laughs> it is weird that it's linked on the universe page. Because uh, that video is very mm. old. And I think the, God, the, the, the narration in it is super expository and super, it's not great. I don't know. It's it's very, oh, these are the Averroes. It's, it's, it's like a bio in that it's very here's the 90 seconds to get you up to speed with what's yeah. happening kind of you know yeah i i do like how it told you like okay this is ash and her group and what they believe in this is sejuani and her group and what they believe in that made it very clear cut um and then it was lissandra was like and then there's us the frost guard and everyone thinks we're just up here guarding but really we gonna come down and fuck everybody up <laughs> so it was like okay like i kind of get i just don't know why it's on the one video chosen to be on Ash's page, I guess. Well, I mean, of the th- so, what else does she have? She has uh, Legends Never Die, and she has that really old. Oh, that's fair. One with you know Master E flipping the around. The very first whatnot. like cinematic. You know? What else? Yeah, she's in Ignite. Ignite. This is the most lore focused one, probably. Right. She's she's barely featured. I mean, mm. her her form is featured in a bunch of cinematics, even though she doesn't actually do anything in them. Yeah, she's in the clouds, right? And that that warriors one, maybe, maybe not. She's she's in the clouds and warrior. She's in like she's a statue in God that climb one. Oh, oh uh, yeah, rise. Yeah. Mm. God, you just know every time she's <laughs> popped up. Very impressive. Um, so we can move on to the comic book next. Although, I is Trindamir really mentioned in anything else? No. Because I do want to talk about him a little I think, bit. Yeah, now's a good time to talk about Trindamir, I think. Mm-hmm. Or you go ahead, uh, John. So. Yeah, he, he pops up again in A Smoldering Coal, which is technically one of Trindamir's stories that Ash is kind of mentioned in with mm. as well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to the relationship. I mean, it like... It does sort of seem to come out of nowhere in terms of the bio, like it's given this tiny paragraph. And in a way, I like it and don't like it. I like that a romance isn't the main focus for her, which is something that you'd see a lot with female characters, that their main focus would be some kind of romance. Um, I also like that she has the potential to have multiple husbands. That's phenomenal to me. That's not questioned. That's hilarious. Like, that's great. Um, but I, I almost wish that it was given a little bit more time because I could see that being an interesting relationship, but only getting like four sentences. I get it was the bio though, but I would, if we're going to get another short story or another little comic, I would really like to see how do people feel about Ash's chosen, whatever they call it. I don't remember. They don't say husband, but. Bloodsworn. Yeah. I think is Bloodsworn. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or Oathfather. Mm-hmm. There's a, they use a, a oh. two terms and they kind of use them interchangeably. I'm not sure which is which. Yeah. So I will say the, the smoldering coal doesn't necessarily talk about, I guess, perception of the union as much, especially since throughout that story, Ash is actually gone. Um, Kind of the, the premise of that story is that the Winter Claw is attacking, so Ash takes a third of all the warriors up north to push them back and then leaves Trindamir kind of in charge of the homestead while she's gone. <laughs> Interesting. And I guess while a third of the warriors were gone, Winter Claw attacked is another white... one of the settlements. Oh, okay. I don't know why I thought it was White Claw, and then I remember that's that <laughs> alcoholic drink everybody's drinking. Right the now. White Claw just wrecked water. the White Girl tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they, they've attacked the tribe of Britneys. The red wines are next. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> so the white claws attacked. Okay. The, the winter claws. <laughs> I know. Attacked another tribe, but since a third of their warriors were gone, they pretty much got slaughtered. So the leader of that tribe comes as kind of like a blood for a blood. It's like, well, mm. Ash taking all our units away really fucked us here, and I demand vengeance. But, you know, the only one there is Trindamir. And we we kind of get to see this whole story is told through the eyes of one of her battle maidens uh, named Sigra. And the person who comes to be like, hey, I demand vengeance is actually Sigra's mom. And essentially, Sigra has to stand up and defend Trindamir against attack. And then Trindamir just kind of rescues her and then fucking flips into a rage. <laughs> it's very interesting because they never talk about it necessarily. It's It's kind of told through like the... It, it's almost like a horror story <laughs> style storytelling. She's like, I remember once when I wanted to see 
the rage in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he does go into a rage, it very much cuts away. And <laughs> but uh, but it does kind of seem like Sigra, at least at the onset, before she saw the rage, was was also kind of like this is kind of a weird pairing. Like I don't get what the appeal is with this dude. He's got these dull eyes. <laughs> like I don't understand it. And it isn't until he sees him completely fucking wreck <laughs> her mom that she was like ooh hell yeah like, okay i get i get it now. ew what <laughs> that's what got her going <laughs> guys you murdered my mom so good babe <laughs> to be fair her mom was gonna murder her Trinomir caught the axe with his hand. Yeah, that was pretty okay, cool. Okay, okay, I, I did read this, and this was, I thought this was a, a neat story. I find Trinomir to be pretty boring in general, so it was neat to find something that made me interested in him, mm. I guess I would say. So, you know, it, it yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, I think what interests me, it, it, Trinomir doesn't really interest me, but his relationship to Ash interests me, and the, uh, the idea that Ash is kind of like the alpha in the situation really goes against a lot of tropes and stereotypes, and I love the idea of it a lot, so. And I think part of it, too, the I don't think this is explicitly said, but the impression that I got from reading some of the stories was that part of the reason he was chosen was... Ash, I mean, Ash didn't want to alienate any of the tribes by marrying one of them, but she also didn't want to just marry someone random that a head of the tribe could kind of have killed mm. and then vie for that spot. So Trindamir was kind of the, I'm not going to upset anybody, and no one's going to fucking kill him <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, it's a really, again, shrewd, very shrewd. Ash does a really good job of mm-hmm. uh, finding the path around, right? Doing the things that... Yeah. Go outside of tradition in a way that is, a, you know, step for, steps forward in terms of let's bring the Froyord into the uh, Rune Terran century. I don't know, whatever the hell time it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we can jump to War Mother then, which <clears throat> covers um, a lot of what we talked about in the bio from Ash, you know, living with her mom and her mom being a very bad leader, um, up, kind of up until Ash starts getting a new tribe together essentially yeah yeah it, it's a pretty this was one after i read the bio I, I was hoping that this is what it would cover because it was one of the three scenes i really wanted to see was what happened from the end when her mother died to when she started becoming a, a war mother a chieftain right it's very that's a lot of shit to go through um so yeah uh, i can go through here um real quick i guess i don't know i'm not a comic guy I don't know how best to credit this, so I was just going to go with the main ones on there, which were writer Odin Austin Schaefer, artist Nina Vakuva, letterer Cardinal Ray, and cover art by Yasmin uh, Putri. Sorry for any mispronunciations. Um, and then there were some editor credits that unfortunately I... There's a lot on there. I don't know comics. Uh, so, so I guess diving into it. So it's across four issues, and we start with Ash as a, I guess a young teen, would you say? 13 14 maybe does that seem about right I, I wasn't quite sure from some of the depictions maybe a little older 15 that sounds right yeah yeah she's somewhere in her teen years and we we see that uh her mother grena so this is about the time where her mother has been gotten pretty obsessed with the myth of avarosa's throne and has been leading the tribe through more and more problems and putting them on a darker not darker but more problematic path making things more difficult um, and the latest is that she wants to push for a raid into another tribe's territory for to survive the winter, and she's getting pushed back, literally, from her sister uh, <laughs> Helner, and as well as the tribe's frost priest, a uh, guy called Mal- Malcrum, I think. I think Malcrum. But yeah, so it's in, in there I, being much more. We need to put down roots. We need to put down seed, and so we get ready and batten down for winter. Um, but Grena wins in it. They have an actual physical duel uh, to see who's right. Grena wins, and so the tribe goes to goes to raid. Grena pushes the tribe kind of to the point of exhaustion. Um, I know we mentioned Iceborne before. It's established a lot in War Mother that there are people who are not Iceborne. They're, I think they're just regular humans, right? And they're called Hearthbound. Does that sound right? Mm. I think so. I was a little... It wasn't super clear. Yeah, they don't do a great job on, initially with it. I think after going through all four, I, I felt pretty confident that the Hearthbound are essentially just... They're just people. They're they're like camp followers. <laughs> if you think about an army normally going along, you've got your actual warriors and then all the, the people who you know make camp and f- cook the fires and all the logistics mm. and shit. And so the Iceborn can, can, can kind of survive on these these longer outings and the Hearthbound are... You know, they're regular people and they, they're, they're not as well suited for it. Um, 
Yeah, Ash is in like a tank top <laughs> in all of these, by the way. Yeah, I don't know if that's. I don't know if any of that's just <laughs> to like a, a, not have to fix her I costume or what, or what. <laughs> <laughs> she has like a cloak and whatever, but like yeah, her like arms are bared. Yeah, um, but essentially, it, it does kind of point to there being a bit of a schism, especially in how Grena treats them. Is something that kind of highlights that Grena doesn't really give a shit about the Hearthbound and is just kind of pushing everyone kind of past their point. Uh, it comes to a head when they finally do find the herds that they were raiding for. The the herders run off, and Grena says, "Oh, well, the reason they ran off is because they've got something even more valuable." And it's like, "March on!" <laughs> and there's a great little one panel of Ash in a very quiet what? And it's so it's so much a question mark thing. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, and Mount Malcrum as well kind of steps in and says, "No," uh, and they almost come to blows. Um, and Ash kind of convinces Malcrum to take the Hearthbound and go back home and her and her mother and I guess all, is it all the Iceborn or just the Bloodsworn um, or are they one and the same with this tribe? My guess would be they're probably one and the same. Yeah. Yeah so all of essentially all of Grena's husbands um, I think there are is it five total? <laughs> five Bloodsworn? Is that right? I can't keep track I'm not exactly. not sure. Yeah. A small handful. Good we'll for say. her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> small hand, her small handful of husbands yeah. and one of them who actually is Ash's father. Yeah, uh, Ural, I'll say. Y R A E L. That's a. Mm. Yeah. Um, so essentially, the, everyone else goes back home. Ash and this small group keep going. They push on for six more days, run out of food, run out of supplies, and it becomes very clear to Ash that all of a sudden her mother's mental state is almost entirely deteriorated. Talk about how she's not been sleeping. And as this revelation happens, they get ambushed by Frostguard and this big ass Frostguard warrior they call it Draclorn. And he just starts to start slaughtering uh, people, kind of left and right. Eventually, Ash gets away with two of the Bloodsworn. Her mother and, and everyone else end up kind of sacrificing themselves to give them time. And Ash, I can't remember how it's exactly established, but Ash knows that she specifically is being chased by this Draclorn guy. I don't know how she knew that. Does that? But it's important because that's why she decides to split them up. And so the two remaining guys are going to go back home, and she's going to go off separately to try and keep it just lead them away does that sound right i think so i mean i'm it's hard to know with ash who again is very shrewd if her plan was just to lead them away so you know the rest can get out or if she actually did want to get to the end of her mother's map because there's this revelation that her mother has that the the throne of avarosa was for ash it wasn't for her yeah it, it, which was a really emotional it was really well done. I liked that. Yeah, sorry, I'm not trying to skim that over hard, too much. But... It's just there's a there is, these are no, no, dense no. comics, yeah, no. <laughs> so, so I want to make sure that we don't spend so much summarizing. Them. But yes, that is a su- that's actually pretty important because it's. I mean, you can see it as a reader real quick. I'll say that she is completely falling apart, and it is really sweet to see that. You know, it wasn't some weird personal vanity pursuit. I don't know something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Her uh, the entire character is incredibly fascinating in a very morally gray area where you don't really know how to feel about her and ash's relationship is is in that area too which which i really liked seeing portrayed yeah yeah definitely um so ash is on the run she's essentially kind of chased to the point of exhaustion following her mother's last map which just kind of leads her up a cliff face a cliff face sorry and when she gets there she sees that there's nothing but an unmarked grave says oh this is all for naught um but she wants to die with her eyes open is a big thing. You know, just die fighting, right? So she goes over by the grave and kind of sees the sun's rising and preps to make her last stand. And she sees this Draclorn guy and a couple of his, his cronies come up to her and he takes his helmet off. And shocker, it's Malcrum. <gasps> it was Malcrum the whole time, guys. How could you, Malcrum? How could you, Malcrum? I want, I want this champion, by the way. This guy was so fascinating because he's playing as like this very gentle, kind-hearted priest the whole time. And then he takes off his helmet and he's like, oh yeah, I slaughtered your mom. Whoopsie. <laughs> yeah, they, they say like specifically, I've never seen one this strong. And the whole and even Ash makes comparison directly to him and saying like, oh, I've seen mm-hmm. Malcolm do his shit and this is nothing compared to what this guy can do. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. he was intentionally, yeah. He was sandbagging. Like, he was intentionally <laughs> hiding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the reveal of Malcolm, yeah, I was going to say is, is, is interesting as well because when he does that, he also insinuates that he's working under orders. He's working as a part of a larger organization and efforts to specifically to kind of quash this myth that her mother was chasing. And he, he, he frames it as I was protecting the tribe. I, I didn't so much betray y'all. I was protecting you because as long as your mother's efforts didn't bear fruit, they were fine letting you all kind of be. 
but now that you've gotten to this point, we got to kill everyone. Uh, <laughs> that being said, as they're having this confrontation, the sun finally rises. Ash takes her chance. Um, does a pretty good job of incapacitate, incapacitating the two guys, but Malcolm gets on top of her, and she, at that moment, feels Ash's true ice bow, and her hair goes white, and she fucking blasts the guy, and it's pretty fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so she steps, and so that's her having kind of taken the ice bow. She, I, There's a really good line in there at the end where it talks about how that part of the legend that the bow was there at the grave was not in there at all, and it's been entirely adapted and rewritten after the fact because she happened to find it there because she found it there now all the legends say oh of course the the boat was there but in reality that was the first time anyone had ever heard of it you know being there um, which was a neat kind of mm. in line um do we want to pause because there's two more issues there's two more issues to go through and they're kind of i think they're kind <laughs> yeah. of small separate arcs if we want to talk about the first half a little bit um, yeah that sounds good um yeah we'll give you a break as well <laughs> yes thank you I, that's really <laughs> yeah. what i need it's a ve- yeah it's a very cool comic this uh, is great and i do like I do like that we get callbacks to 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 that whole final confrontation where he's like, "Oh, I'm part of a bigger organization," and we, you know, we see how he acted weak but turned out super strong. We also get to see that kind of happen in the in the next issue, which is a, a nice callback to see kind of how widespread this organization actually is, and uh, and digging into more of the Frost Guard too, because I actually I hadn't read a whole lot about the frost guard when i first read the comic so reading up more about the frost guard and then going back and reading like it it makes a lot more sense now <laughs> what what the whole issue there was yeah i mean the whole yeah. all the frost priest stuff is interesting i guess i guess we can just push on and we, we can uh we'll wrap up the second half because i think there's a little bit less to kind of cover in the second arc i guess we say i think um, so sure. yeah you can you can go over it pretty quickly sure yeah so um so ash at this point is Oh, I guess, by the way, I should also mention that when she found that, that ice bow at the very end, we see in the last panel shot that it was, this was definitely something important because it's on top of this frozen battle. And you can see riders and their mounts and warriors all frozen in the ice underneath. So whatever this was, was definitely some place. It was not some random crap that she found, I would, I would say. I know what it was. Oh, John knows what it was. Beautiful. He dug deeper, I guess. No, I'm, 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 I'm excited to hear. Uh, so mm-hmm. let me think. Where's Ash? Yes, Ash is wandering around. She's in a place they call the Ice Sea at this point, which is essentially the seemingly frozen tundra. She goes out to, they call them they're the lands of the Lost Ones or the Earth Sign. They're kind of used interchangeably, I thought, but they're essentially humans mm-hmm. who who left their tribes to go, go get really intimate with the Voli Bear, uh, the Thousand <laughs> Pierce Bear, um, which gets dropped here, and they become something other than human um, but ash is out hunting because she's starving she gets attacked by a giant worm creature that they call a grelfine is i think yeah. how it's pronounced it's really big i've never seen one in anywhere else in league but they're really cool and looks or, a little bit like baron yeah it, it, you know i bet you know <laughs> they're probably related i bet you there's some deep lore somewhere that they're related um <laughs> But a warrior shows up to help Ash, and it turns out to be Sejuani, her old childhood friend, who they've been you know been separated for about five years. It says, uh, and the two of them slay it. They harvest the meat because Sejuani's tribe is starving. They're having a, very, a food shortage issue. We we quickly learn, and as they're they're leaving, they get kind of chased off into the sea by this this really cool storm that <laughs> is not really it's not really clear what it's depicting. But Ash says there are things in there and there's something wrong with them and they, they look very uh, almost Shadow Isles y in coloring and they you know kind of spectral, right? It's really weird. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, it made me excited to get to Vola Bear, which unfortunately is very far from now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, this came out before the Vola Bear rework, rework yeah. right? Really? Uh, you probably did. Yeah, that's a pretty recent thing. Might have been I'm, in the works, though. I'm really curious. Because I didn't actually read the comic until very recently. I would have been very confused had I read kind of this portrayal of Volibear and his followers before the rework. Because I would have been thinking of the old Volibear and like, that guy? <laughs> oh, bear? I don't know if you <laughs> want to worry about that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really cool. It's a neat thing. So they get they, they get kind of chased into the sea. Um but it's fine. They float around for about a week, bonding and sharing, reconnecting. And, you know, they talk about how both of them didn't really have any, any other young women growing up. So it was, it feels very nice to have that connection again between the two of them. Um, so they head back to Sejuani's tribe 
And Sejuani tells Ash that the the Frost Priests are after her. I'm not clear how Sejuani knows this or like this information was made available to her. That's one thing that I'm not quite clear on. Mm. But she does. So it's kind of established that, okay, when you get here, there's going to be a lot of enemies and people who don't like you. So you need to start start handing out food immediately so you can get the tribe on your side. <laughs> um, they dock the Frost Priests who do show up and they are... The Frost Priests are obviously have some sort of influence in the tribe, seemingly because they're able to offer their magics and help people, especially the Hearthbound, it talks about, kind of being ones who are very loyal, loyal to them. Probably because they're they're the only ones willing to give a shit about them most of the time. Right. You know? it's, it's hard to fault <laughs> people for being like, oh, thank you, you heal my sick daughter. This other one was going to leave me. Um, yeah. But they're a nefarious, they're, they are obviously a nefarious influence within this tribe and other parts of the Frail Yord. Um, we run into Sejuani's mom, who it, we kind of had also learned was seemingly gone, but has now returned. Um, and I don't think Ash had ever seen her before this. There's a lot of conflict here around, you know, <laughs> do we trust Ash? Do we not trust Ash? It all happens over the span of a night. Um, it feels a little condensed, I would say. But uh, <laughs> essentially, Sejuani's trying to figure out how we're going to get Ash to be safe in a part of our tribe. Um she kind of has a, a, a little confrontation with her own mother in their hut, and we kind of see that... We see this other one. Sejuani's mom, whose name I can't remember, um, is really uncaring. Yeah. Doesn't seem to care at all about her, and just kind of you know punches her. And it's just very much like, fend for yourself, I don't give a shit. The type of person you would expect would create Sejuani, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and Sejuani um, was very close to Ash's mother, which I feel like comes into play a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she kind of explicitly says a little bit later on that she was what I wished my mother was right I, I pretended that mm-hmm. she was my mom um, there was a, there's also another there's a lot of confrontations in this this little section because there's another confrontation <laughs> where the priests kind of try to rally everyone to kill Ash a little bit or they're going to just do it in like like brazenly murder her but they a seem to kind of say you guys know that we know that she's evil so <laughs> right uh, Sejuani steps in though and, and tries to say hey I'm going to make Ash my battle sister and then Sejuani's mom steps in and says just get drunk. Just drink mead. Don't worry about it. We'll figure this out in the morning. <laughs> uh, and Sejuani knows that, look, in the morning, those priests are going to have convinced her to kill you or whatever. So we got to figure this out now. And they do end up becoming battle sisters on their own, just in their own little private ceremony. And meanwhile, Sejuani is also organizing a, a secret uh, a raid. I'm trying, I was trying to say, what's the word? An un... Her mom didn't approve it. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so it's all secret. Mm-hmm. She's trying to find a way to prove herself to the tribe and get control of it. And she brings Ash along. And Ash finds out that what they're doing is not just taking herds. They're going to take everything. And they're going to kill everyone there in this tribe. And this tribe is one that the, the Winter's Claw, Sejuani's tribe, has allied with. So they're, be, they're, they're oath-breaking, essentially. And they're going to kill all the, uh, the witnesses so that no one knows they did it. And then that will solve the problem. And then that will make Sejuani powerful enough to you know, overthrow her mom. And Ash, mm-hmm. <laughs> Ash obviously says no. <laughs> they, they get into a conflict over it. And, you know, they're kind of arguing back and forth. And eventually Ash kind of gets to the point of saying, look, let me take them out to the, the ice sea. Even though you think I want to, no one would survive. I did it. Maybe we can do it. We've got to try. Um, Sejuani lets her, but they, they leave very much not as battle sisters anymore. <laughs> um, and we end the comic with Ash. Some of her group surviving, They've they've made it out to I guess the sea and they're gonna go find their new home and they name her they name her War Mother at the end of it. And that's mm-hmm. how she's now leading oh. the Everosans. That's the name of the comic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The very la- the literal last word in the comic is War Mother. It's not Yeah, the- yeah, it's it's really well done. I really like these four comics and I'm interested to talk about them because I feel like we we might all like them for different reasons, which is very cool and totally like totally fine, but I'm I'm curious of you know how we all how we all interpreted them, I guess, and what we got from them personally. Sure, I, I mean, hmm. I thought they were. I thought it was very inter- entertaining. I, th- I, um, I'm not like I said. I'm not a comics guy. It's hard for me to. I don't have like as much of the toolbox to describe all the different parts of it that I liked. Yeah. But overall, it felt like a very just a very strong piece. Um, I thought that the depiction of the Frail Yord it had it added some nice depth to the Frail Yord. The, I always found the region kind of in the world that part of Runeterra boring. This, I thought, helped yeah. get us a bit more into the nitty-gritty of it in a way that um, felt very real and felt like it made a lot of sense. Sometimes with League, they will they will give you ideas that are real cool, and then when you try and think about how does that, <laughs> how does that work practically, what is that, how does this actually work IRL, 
it, it there's no specifics and this i thought helped give some specifics around how at least some of these tribes kind of interact i thought all of the frost priest stuff was neat to see um to better kind of flesh out the real influence that lissandra has is another neat thing you know Okay, yeah, so they work for Lissandra Frost Priest? Yeah. Oh my god, I didn't fucking know that. Okay, I yeah, I'm yeah. super interested in the She's Frost She's the leader Priest. of the Frost Guard. I knew the Frost Guard, but I didn't know Frost Guard and Frost Priest were the same thing. Yeah, the Frost Peace Priests are members of the Frost Guard. Oh, okay. I, I didn't quite catch on to that. Yeah, I am like immensely interested in the Frost, Pri- Frost Priest. That's very hard to say. Would love a Frost Priest champion. <laughs> I think that would be fascinating. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree, Mark, that it it adds more depth to the Freljord because I also didn't find it very interesting. And when we first talked about them at all, we talked about like three warring tribes and I was like, oh, I don't care. I don't find that interesting. But finding the backstory behind Ash and Sejuani and how they really really care about each other and where they have disagreed and where the conflict came from is genuinely heartbreaking and ash like in a way realizing that shizwani is kind of right but also wanting to prove her wrong is is a really good it's very great for a protagonist i guess yeah i think one of the things that this story does really well that i think maybe some of the other stories haven't done as great is offering a believable and like reasonable i guess conflict Mm -hmm. the the antagonists aren't black and white uh and the conflict itself like you really can see both sides of it depending on which character you support more like you know like i can i can fully believe someone growing up like sejuani grew up taking control of your mother like that has to be a top priority because bad shit's gonna happen otherwise and if this is what it's gonna take to wrest control for my mother like that's gotta happen and you can totally see ash's point of view we're like yeah i get that but like (laughs) you can't just go around murdering people (laughs) including children they definitely they have a line where when the guy is defending one of the people who's gonna be slaughtered is defending children as far as i know they were not gonna leave any survivors so i mean it's yeah they can't they girl hardcore, man. Yeah, Shit. it's unfortunately... <laughs> it's going to be a long time before we get to Se- Sejuani, and I'm I'm interested to, to learn more from her perspective, I guess. Um, I feel like what I got from the comics, what I really liked, um, in these high fantasy settings, it can be difficult to get... Uh, you can get really great women characters, but it's hard to find ones that are connecting with each other. A lot of the times it's like a woman and she's surrounded by guys. But in this instance, we get two mother-daughter relationships that are each really like very complex. We get women who are power hungry and who abandon their children, which is not something you get from, it sounds weird to be like, I want to see more women who are horrible, (laughs) but like kind of, like it's just not a, a, a trait you get. And women do get power hungry and abandon their children, you know, it happens. And and the relationship between Ash and Sejuani, the best part when they're on that boat together and just kind of bonding over, you know, their kind of position as being expected to take over and, you know, all the pressure, being surrounded by guys. It was just, there's an importance when you're a woman to have friends who are women. And I think that gets overlooked a lot. And I don't know, it was mentioned here and it was shocking and lovely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if I have much to add on it. I, I definitely, I really liked seeing, like I think like you said, having the two mother-daughter relationships. Um, mm-hmm. And the, I, I, I thought it was, a, it was it was a strong way to contrast them. I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, I don't have much to add on, on that aspect, but I definitely, I, I definitely agree with everything that you said here, really. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, so to, to piggyback a little bit on, and, and not to, not to, push us ahead but no no, like, no. to we piggyback should, both yeah. on ash's preservation of life as well as her political shrewdness kind of leads pretty well into the short story that we have for ash the harder path by lillian harrington yeah this one's uh really really short um and just kind of shows us a small little blink into ash's life as a war mother i guess um was someone go- i guess i could I don't remember anyone's names, but I, I could probably probably summarize what happened. Yeah, go ahead uh, and summarize, oh, and I'll just add in names. Okay, <laughs> okay. So it is a celebratory night 
something pertaining with the three sisters. Yes. We have Harvest Festival. I think okay, I did a, not write that name down. <laughs> the har- a Harvest Festival. Yeah, I don't think it has a specific name. It's just a the Harvest Festival, you know. <laughs> Um, so one thing I wasn't sure, is it only Avarosians who are celebrating this right now altogether? Uh, I think my so. My guess, because they do say they got a lot of tribes mm. together. It, I think it is Avarosians. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so they're all chilling. Ash does like a cool, like, I'm going to shoot this fire with my ice arrow display. Um, mostly because there wasn't much going on in the story, so they needed to make it a little bit longer, I think. Uh, so she's kind of wandering around and then comes to the end of where everyone's celebrating and runs into a woman. Hilder. Hilder. Who of the is, snow followers. Of the snow followers. Um, they had, okay, now I'm looking at John's notes. They would murdered a tribe that swore allegiance to the Avarosans. And I have a little note here just based on the description of the event. This is not confirmed anywhere, at least that I could find. But this might be the village from the Legends Never Die video. I didn't rewatch it for this. I did, but I didn't with this with that thought in mind. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely have to. Um, so Hil- Hildur, Hildor, Hil- Hordor, Hildur. Hildur. There's an H. There's a second H in there <laughs> in the middle. Hildur. Hildur. It might be silent. It's probably. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Hilder realizes her error and she should not have killed those people so she lays down her axe and is like please kill me Ash but spare my people but I'm a- an asshole and a fuck up and I, I done goofed it uh, so Ash picks up the axe that's a weird sentence Ash picks up the axe <laughs> and she does really want to kill Hilder because like a bunch of her people have died but she uh, does show mercy and says that they are now Av Arosans and they can join in on the festivities. No one seems to care that she's done this. They're like, okay, yay, woo! And it's, then they all start drinking. It's a quick 180 that they did because it's definitely said like that everyone was like, yeah, murder them. And then she's like, you're one of us now. And then they're like, yeah. You know what? Fair. Honestly, people do have that quick of a turnaround sometimes. That's true. I, I guess an important thing to note here too is the, the reason that she had killed the tribe was that she had sworn an oath that no faith traders would ever again follow those falsely claiming to be Avarosa reborn. Oh, which, okay. Which, you know, stories have probably passed that like, yeah, Ash says she's Avarosa reborn because that's kind of the thing that she has to play up to get a lot of the followers. So that's why she killed them. She actually came to this feast planning on challenging and killing Ash in front of all her followers but then saw her do her fancy ice arrow display and was like, oh shit, I was wrong. It is Avarosa. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, an, that's a, it's a, an interesting thing that you bring up is that she was swayed by the ice arrow display. So as much as, yeah, they wanted to throw something into the story, uh, it's also... It's it, true. I mean, it, it, how much you believe the 180 kind of depends on how much you believe... How much, how much you believe people believe she is Avarosa, I guess, to be fair. Um, yeah. I was willing to give that some some leeway because it, it, on the one hand what happens when you've got one tribe who says no i'm i'm not no like what happens then how do they solve that um but it, you can just say it's speaking to how how influential ash is with that playing up that myth and how much she can get people to come together which is fine i i, I kind of say do we believe she is avarosa well uh john <laughs> i don't <laughs> yeah i'm just putting it out there I mean, Ash doesn't believe it either, so... It's hard to say. Okay, so there's a small interaction in this story where she picks up the axe, which is a true ice axe, and she feels like she's getting ready to meet out some justice, and then she feels her bow Mm. kind of reverberating, and then when that happens, Mm -hmm. she then grants mercy. Um, So what's up with that interaction? Is that a case of the bow... Maybe the bow's Avarosa. The bow is Avarosa. That's what I kind of wondered. Is is the bow like her will in, or spirit in some way and it's influencing Ash? Mm-hmm. The bow is a lighten. A, li- <laughs> a lighten. You see, it's the opposite of a darken. I was just going <laughs> to joke that she was a darken. And then put... <laughs> no, that is interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I I, uh, I, I will say I, I, I like this. this. I wanted to see a story of Ash as she is now dealing with some just a modern day issue and how she handles herself. Um, and I liked that that was what this was and that she uh, has some good internal monologue about kind of really kind of almost reviling, 
know, she questions, do they even show up because of me or do they show up because they think I'm Avarosa? But regardless, they showed up and that's the important part. And I yeah. like that yeah. perspective that she yeah. has. Yeah, it's true. It was a short story that actually gave us some more insight. And that was from Ash's point of view and I still enjoyed. <laughs> yes, that's what I was going to yeah. say. It's the one, I think so far, that I really... Tell about Ash being a main a main character, a protagonist. Like, okay, if you, this is almost like proof of of concept that you can have this story from her perspective and it works. Um, and I think that speaks to yeah. how strong she is as a main character in League. <laughs> All right, so there is one more story that is heavily Ash focused. It is a Quinn story. Oh, <laughs> I did read uh, this. Is this still canon? Sorry. This is technically not canon, oh. but I don't know what parts of it aren't because the parts that I did read definitely seemed to align with everything that is still canon. So I don't know specifically what parts of it aren't, but this story is basically following, it's called Journey into the Freljord. It's by an unknown author, probably because it was written before the authors got credit. Now, basically, since Ash has been unifying all these Freljordian tribes, Demacia has started to take notice. And they're like, oh shit, if she unifies enough of these tribes and they decide to come down, like, we might actually have a problem here. So they sent Quinn and Valor to assess the risk of an attack. So... This is so Daenerys, right? Like, I don't know. Like, this, <laughs> everything about Ash screams Daenerys Targar Targaryen. I could see that. Now... Demasi apparently views Freljord as all barbaric and uncivilized. That's kind of the impression that Demasi oh. has of the Freljord, because all they know is like, oh, they're all these separate tribes. They do have a lot of barbarians there, so I guess that's not too far off. But that's kind of how they view the whole area, as opposed to that just being part of it. So when Quinn gets to Ash's kind of home settlement, and they're very organized and friendly, she and She's really taken in by Ash and her <laughs> leadership style. Valorin really likes her. And she sees that all the people have really adapted to the hardships of the Freljord. She's like, oh, okay, well, may have been wrong here. Uh, she does, however, after talking to a bunch of people, notice like a current of unease throughout the camp as a lot of people seem to be afraid of Sejuani. So she continues her questing to go talk to Sejuani and realizes that Sedge is also uniting tribes around the Freljord, but in a different way than Ash. She's just conquering Ash's tribes <laughs> and then saying, want to join us now? Otherwise, we'll kill you. Mm. So she is also gathering an army, and a lot of them are from Ash's own tribes. This obviously is a much bigger threat to Demacia mm -hmm. because this is already proven to be very warlike. Um, another thing that she notices about Ash's tribes at this point is that if people attack, since Ash is uniting tribes from all over the Freljord, but they're not all necessarily moving from where they are to Ash's stronghold. A lot of them are just, you know, we're an Avarosan tribe now, but we're staying here. Since they're so spread out across the Freljord, she can't send people to protect all of them in case of an attack. Like one of these places, they're pretty small. They could be attacked and conquered in a matter of hours. So she notices that Ash while uniting the tribes, is not capable of actually protecting all the tribes that are under her banner, which she thinks is also leading a lot of tribes to Sejuani, who might be more capable of protecting them. Uh, so she also, at this point, hears <laughs> whispers of an ice witch and mm -hmm. troll attacks. Um, and so she decides to talk to Ash's other allies, and maybe this is actually the bit that isn't canon anymore um the frost guard the frost guard in this i guess reality are established allies of ash oh okay and i don't think they are in current canon you know i'm not sure i think i i, I think they might be or at the very least they're not openly hostile i think i can't speak mm. to the uh the war mother comics i don't know if those were guys, it's hard to say about what was going on with that little specific raiding party that she killed, or if she just assumed they were frost priests. Because I don't know if people make the connection between the frost priests. That is hard to say, and um, and uh. Lysandra yet. So I think it might still be the case that they're at least not an open open conflict. Um, and Lysandra is still pretty much on the down. All right. But, um, nice. Then we are still in canon potentially. <laughs> maybe uh. somewhat. Maybe. So she. <laughs> Um, so she goes to visit the Frost Guards, led by Lysandra. 
no one really knows at this point that the ice witch that everyone has been spreading rumors about actually is Lysandra. <laughs> That's kind of under wraps. Uh, when they get to the Frost Guard, Quinn mentions that Valor does not like Lysandra at all, mm-hmm. but assumes that that's because Lysandra's more typical nobility, kind of like Demasi and no- loyal, or, uh, nobility, who Valor and hates. So she mm-hmm. assumes that's why. Uh, although she starts to feel like they're hiding something because Lysandra's just dismissing all these threats of the Ice Witch as children's tales, saying that the trolls' threats are overstated. So at night, she and Quinn get up and start scouting around, and they see that all the buildings there are marked with the symbol of an open staring eye, and there's a group of frost guard knelt in a circle around a stone, speaking in a strange tongue. So they're like, uh, fuck this, <laughs> I'm out, and they dip. And uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of it for this story, but it at this time, the frost guard are definitely outwardly saying, yes, we are allies of Ash and the Avarosans, uh, but secretly, they're just doing their own thing. <laughs> yeah. I think I would say this is like 90% canon. Yeah. It, yeah. I'm sure there's some little thing in there, but I, I didn't catch what it was that's wrong. Maybe we will when we get to, you know, either <laughs> either Sedge or, or Lis lore. But... Get, it makes me want to get some Demacia because that's another that's group. That's true. We haven't really got much of them. The more I'm learning about them, the less I like them. <laughs> <laughs> You'll like Lux, maybe. Yeah, they don't seem your style. Yeah, you probably won't like them. Yeah. That's true. Before we hop in, because I've got a few alternate universes here, was there anything else we wanted to talk about main universe Ash <laughs> before we <laughs> hop into some some buck wild alternate universes? I don't know. I, I I don't. There's a lot. There's a lot. I think this is definitely one where sometimes we complain about there not being a lot of text to pull from, and I think there's more than enough, and it leaves me feeling very satiated when it comes to to Ash. Like I don't. I don't know if I need to just to, to really dig down and try and pull apart to get stuff at, from her. I feel like I've been given a lot of the things that I wanted, frankly. Um, I give yeah. her a, a big old yeah. S-plus in the lore department. She might be my favorite lore-wise <laughs> so far. Um, just overall. Yeah, it's definitely so far. It's been the most interesting. I would read, if they release more comics, I would read them even without to do with the podcast. Sure. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. That's high praise. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I would also say that little story you just went through. I think that casts the the idea of the the Averosan tribes not actually moving um, casts a very interesting angle on that whole conflict as well. Because um, it does seem like a much bigger issue of how the fuck would anyone ever say that they're an Averosan tribe, if, especially if you're right next to Sejuani's tribe? Could you imagine? Like, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> Just don't put the flags up, man. Just let it be. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting problem. How do you solve it, right? Especially with with this group of, this whole region where everyone's so rooted and relatively independent. How do you get, every, how do you get everyone to sit down and, and shut up and, and start fixing shit, you know? It's interesting. <laughs> exactly. And I think, again, something that wasn't necessarily talked about in the Ashes lore, but was talked about in that Trindomir short story was like, it opened up with him kind of leading court where he has subjects come in and air their grievances basically. Mm. And it is kind of clear that it would not work to just have everybody come move to the stronghold because they all have very strong opinions about how things are supposed to happen. (laughs) There are certain tribes that think themselves way more civilized than other tribes. There are certain tribes that have like certain, you know, uh, farming grounds that are kind of sacred to them that they can't abandon and just recreate other places. Uh, so it the the whole problem of unification, like you definitely can't just move people in one place because you'd get way more unrest that way too. So yeah, it's a it's a tough problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, honey, take us to the high noon. Let me tell well, you about high noon ash. <laughs> <laughs> So, alternate universe number one, High Noon. Now, we've already talked about one of the champions. It was Alistar was part of High Noon lore. Mm, Kind of. (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) Showed up. Ash is a much more prominent part of this. She is a mechanical angel built at the dawn of the pioneer age and powered by the blood of the deities gunned down in the infamous land rush that destroyed the heavens. Holy shit, that's awesome. (laughs) <laughs> That's the coolest thing you've ever said. What? <laughs> so she's a robot powered by god blood? That's yes. awesome. Oh my god. I'm going to go I, read this shit. I'm playing High New Nash from now on. Yeah. I, Her horse is named Virtue. 
I don't care. <laughs> I care that she about. runs. <laughs> <laughs> she just does she guzzle up god blood? Is there? She is it always there? doesn't guzzle up oh. god blood. That's the thing. She has a time stamp on herself, basically, because <gasps> oh. the humans killed the gods. Uh, in the land rush, which destroyed heaven. Since heaven didn't exist anymore when people died, they all went to hell. Hell overflowed, and now what? demons and devils are walking the earth, which is why Thresh and Hecarim are roaming the high noon lands oh, again. Man. This is awesome. So this oh short story God. is all about. No, Ash. I never. Oh, I, I never knew this is what High Noon was about <laughs> at all. By the way, that hell overflowed. Me so neither. now they're just in. The, the just the regular everyday shit. I want a movie and I want it now. It would be like supernatural, but better. That's so fucking good. Yeah, that's so cool. Sorry, I can't. That's awesome. I'm gonna go read this. <laughs> yeah, no, right it was now. Oh my god. We need a high noon episode. <laughs> so this this whole story was Ash and Darius. Darius in this uh in this reality is just a he's a he's essentially called a man killer. He's a bounty hunter. So she hires him to help her hunt Hecarim because he's kind of one of the high-level devils. He's not just like a demon. He's like a devil from hell that escaped, and he cannot be beaten by a single person, it's said. So she hires Darius to accompany her, and this kind of just chronicles their travels down into his lair, at which point... <laughs> Uh, spoilers for anyone who hasn't read this story yet. <laughs> earmuffs, earmuffs. Uh, it turns out that Hecarim had reached out to Darius in his dreams and offered him a deal <gasps> for power if he killed Ash. So right at the final confrontation, Darius turns on Ash. Ash takes him down a bit, doesn't kill him, but does manage to get away. And then she sets off in search for Lucian, a notorious demon slayer. Hell yeah. That sounds really cool. That sounds awesome. It was pretty fucking cool, though. It sounds so cool. That's such a cool lore. That's like really... I love that that that, that world-building lore. That's so <laughs> cool. Oh, man. I don't know. Yeah, it's the first, the first AU that I found really interesting. Honestly, you know what? If I really got into it, I think I could find the KDA lore a little interesting <laughs> and fun for like a, a poppy kind of cute way. But this one's just badass. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. <laughs> yeah. That's dope. Now, let me tell you about a AU number two. The Cosmic Council slash Dark Star AU. Now, Ash leads the Cosmic Council in this one. This is basically a council which protects against the growing influence of the Dark Star. The Dark Star is a cosmic destroyer who is led by a harbinger who guides the Dark Star to sources of life for it to consume. Now, this may sound familiar to you because... It is Galactus and the Silver Surfer. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, as you were saying that, I was like, I, I don't. I'm not a comic guy, but I'm familiar <laughs> with that story a little bit. So she, uh, she leads the council. Um, she leads. She sends Lux to bind Galactus and the Silver Surfer. There's like a whole council of light beings, you know, Lux and I'm trying to remember some of the other ones. Master Yi was in here, Cassadin, I think, and then there was a few people who were talked about as used to be part of the Light Council, but have been corrupted by darkness, such as Mordekaiser, Jin, uh, oh. Thresh. Yeah, there's a lot, Thresh. a lot of Cosmic or Dark Star, dark star skins. Uh, Karma has one, Oriana has one. Yeah. yeah. So basically what happened during this event was she sent Lux to go bind them while the rest of them kind of did their own things to stop this incoming doom, and then they did a fan vote to see which skin you'd prefer or like which story, I guess, something like that, whether you wanted Cosmic Lux or um, Dark Star Lux. Oh. And the fan vote was Dark Star Lux. So then they wrote the latter half of the lore to have Lux go there and confront Thresh and, you know, those fellows and then get defeated by them and become a Dark Star champion herself. It was pretty cool. Oh, shit. Damn. That's pretty neat. I didn't know any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, right? Now, the other two AU she's part of, there's not a whole lot of lore for. She's just she's part of the project mm. uh, lore, similar to Akali. 
And she's also part of the Academy Adventures stories, like all the other. <laughs> does she have an Academy skin? I don't think she does, no. but the Academy Adventures kind of comic, which, I, I mean, I'm sure isn't canon, but <laughs> who knows? Maybe it is can- alternate universe canon. Uh, it, it's got most of the people in it at this point. I think there's probably fewer people that aren't part of the Academy Adventures universe than are at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but those are the AUs. Yeah, if you if you get a chance to read the the High Noon or the Cosmic stories, they're both pretty cool. Well, I'm definitely reading that High Noon story. I don't care about the spoilers. <laughs> I want to that sounds cool. But that when you when you mentioned Darius, I kind of forgot that he has a High Noon. Does he have one? I don't even know if he does. <laughs> well, that's what that's it doesn't why I sound it familiar then. at all. But <laughs> maybe it'll be in the future. Sure, that's a nice way know. to kind of give some hints at something. I'm sure they've got it like on a board somewhere. It's like 2022, whatever. But um, <laughs> yeah, those books yeah, sound pretty do, cool. Oh actually. God, what is his? We- oh, he's got a hatchet instead of Ooh. instead of you know the battle axe. Almost oh. kind of lumberjack scion, if you think about it. He's got a big hatchet, right? In that one. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Daddy Lumberjack Sion. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> I think that's the Don't official. Like that. the official. <laughs> All right. Any more Ash thoughts? This one ran a little long because Ash has a lot of lore, a but that's okay. Stuff. Um, real quick, uh, it's funny you talking about the Dark Star stuff. Um, if you look at Tarek's quotes, I think when he taunts an enemy Ash, he mentions that her bow and its its mistress, or I guess former wielder, are both of the stars. Uh, and if you look into Lysandra's lore a little bit, of the three original sisters, Cyrilda had an interaction with uh, the aspect of Twilight, where she lost her voice, I think it yeah. was. So it raises the slightest bit of question as to maybe Ash is some related to somebody, but maybe it's maybe it's Cyrilda, oh. maybe it's not Everosa, maybe there's something going on. Interesting. I think... So yeah, real real quick actually, oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> to to touch on the the three sisters bit, and this will, I promise it won't take long. No, it's okay. So the three sister, the three original sisters, Avarosa, Lysandra, and Cyrilda, existed long long time ago before even Shurima, and basically they all sought to harness the powers of what lay beyond the mortal realm. Uh, Avarosa faced the twisting dark beneath the world and was deafened by its emptiness waiting to consume all creation, which kind of sounds like the void. Uh, Cyrilda, attempting to command the heavens above, lost her voice to the first twilight. Lysandra stood against the wild magic of the mortal realm, and savage claws of a primal god raked across her eyes, blinding her. So they all lost something in order to try and gain power. Uh, Lysandra made a deal with the Watchers, but when they came to collect, she realized it was a mistake, so she sacrificed all her sisters and all their followers, trapping them in a huge layer of true ice in the middle of a battle. Oh, so that's what Ash found. Prophecies said that Avarosa and Cyrilda would one day return to unite the tribes of the Freljord, so Lysandra has been low-key killing anyone who has previously been hailed as a reincarnation of either of them. Hmm. That's weird because Lysandra also seems to be very much about stopping worship of the old Freljord gods, so like Anivia, Orn, kind of like we talked about. It, it seems like she's got a lot of she's got a lot of leaks to plug, right? It's like okay, well, I got to stop them worshiping Anivia. <laughs> oh fuck, there's someone else saying they're fucking Cyrilda. I got to go deal with that. Um, man, she's really pulling yeah, all so the puppet th- strings. Shit. Basically, the whole Frost Guard exists to destroy and discredit rumors, prophecies, or anything else that would lead people to remember anything about the old world. Because that, in turn, might remind people that Lysandra herself is one of the original three <laughs> fucking gods and and not whoever she's claiming to be right now. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's, that is true. That's interesting. Do we foresee this, if this story goes forward? I don't know how often Riot pushes their lore forward. I feel like it's not that often. But if this goes forward, do we foresee Ash and Sejuani needing to team up again? Because Lysandra seems to be the bigger evil here. Maybe eventually. It's 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 hard to say. I think this really makes me... I think to answer that, I would need to know more about what's going on with Demacia. Because I think... Uh, mm. I think especially with... 
I don't know anything about what's going on with Silas, but I know in that Warriors cinematic, he was in the Frail Yard. And so were Garen and Lux, and I guess also uh, Galio. So there's definitely some interaction going on with, going on there. Mm. And I think that's probably going to be the big catalyst for uh, the next conflict or big change there is going to be. Probably interaction with Demacia. Noxus is also interesting in that way as another... It's going to be like an outsider, I think, will be the big spur, I guess it's, I would say. Um, but probably... Probably Demacia. Noxus is weird because I think Noxus and the Winter's Claw have a lot in... They weirdly have a lot in common, right? And I can almost (laughs) see them being willing to put... To ironically not fight each other. Um, So I don't know. Team up and become Frostus. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or White Claw. White Claw. I guess in terms of what I might want to see, yeah, that's probably what I would want to see. Would be not a big thing with Lissandra yet. That seems like a third act thing. And yeah, yeah. A nice second thing to heighten the tension and conflict more first would be good. Yeah. Especially because of her direct tie mm-hmm. to the void. Like that's that's for sure like the the big bad. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, and those watchers and all that all that jazz. Okay, I think we did it. That's Ash. <sighs> yeah. Well, this feels good. Feels good. <laughs> <laughs> It did feel good to get, like, so much lore after having so many champions that were really, like, kind of shallow, I guess. Definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. All right. So we did it. We uh, did it. Thank you so much for listening. And join us next week when we get to talk about the Star Forger Aurelian Soul. Yeah.